Hello, my name is Lisa Fricke, and I'm here for Sarpy County Outlook with Senator Sue Crawford, District 45. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. Such a pleasure to have you. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Senator Crawford. Uh, Senator Crawford lives in Old Town Bellevue. In addition to serving in the legislature, she continued her job as professor of political science at Creighton University, and she also kept uh, instructing in health and administration policy program. During her years at Creighton, her instruction and research have focused on public policy, civic engagement. Senator Crawford received her BS in 1989 from Truman State University, and in 1995 she completed her PhD at Indiana University Bloomington in the fields of American government and public policy with a concentration in management. I thought it was very interesting uh, that while she was at IU, she worked closely and co-published articles and chapters with Eleanor Ostrom, a Nobel Prize winner in economics, and maybe during the questioning you might tell us more about that. I'll try to do that. All Thank right. You. All right. What do you see as the major accomplishments of the legislature this session? Thank you. And thank you for that warm introduction. Oh, you're welcome. That's wonderful. <laughs> thank you. Well, we had really a, a very full session this year, and many things that we accomplished. Um, one of the one of the accomplishments this session was to really work on reducing the cliff effect for working mm -hmm. families. So we have several policies in the state where we're trying to help people towards self-sufficiency, um, especially those people who are, work, are working families who are still struggling. And so we, and we've been working on this for many years, and this year finally we got bills passed um, for um, assistance and also, very importantly, bills passed for child care assistance um, to make it easier for, for families to continue to work and take a promotion and continue to work and still keep some help from us while they're working their way to self-sufficiency. So in the child care example, they gradually pay a little more, a little more, and a little more until they're able to pay the child care. And that's very important for working families because child care is expensive. And making yes. sure that they're able to have child care while they're working is critical. So I was very proud of us for getting that accomplished this year. We've, wor we've been working on that for a very long time. Okay. The, one of the issues that you've probably heard the most about in the news was prison reform. Right. And so we had that. several bills working on different parts of prison reform. And a couple of the important accomplishments there, in addition to a lot of the sentencing reform you may have heard about, we work very hard to make sure that there's supervision when people leave prison. Because mm -hmm. that's an important public safety concern, exactly. to make sure that when somebody is leaving prison, we are paying careful attention to where they are and what they're, what doing, they're doing, and to make sure that doesn't all fall on our police officers. So that's important. We also, um, as part of our bills, continue to work on improving our juvenile justice system. So when we have some kids who get in trouble, we want to do everything we can to help them turn that around so they, be, so they get out of trouble right. and don't get in our criminal justice system. And so that's the really upfront investment in our, our juvenile justice system to try to reduce the other problems we see in the prison system. So those, are, those were important parts of that. And then as, as you probably also noted, um, we passed a tough um, a tough bill, but we passed a bill to increase investment in our infrastructure, mm -hmm. and that was very important. And that bill actually funnels money directly to our cities and directly to our counties, as well as to the state, to address crumbling infrastructure. So that was an important accomplishment that we did. And it, it was a tough, a tough right. vote, but it was really important because we really need to invest in our infrastructure, and that leads to jobs. And also, again, that money goes directly to the cities and the counties, as well as some to the state. And so we're really investing in all levels of government in that infrastructure. I think that's really important. I was just watching the news the other day, and they showed the bridge collapse in Minnesota. Right. And so we don't want any disasters no. like that in our in right. our state. Right. And also you talked about when prisoners uh, get out, especially in the juvenile system, looking at um, watching out for them afterwards as an investment. Right. I think that's the perfect word right. to use. And it's also critical because it's part of what we continue to do to reduce property taxes. Right. So the fact that the money is going to the cities, that two cents go to the city and two cents go to the counties um, really helps to reduce that load on the property tax. Good. And we also passed another bill to um, increase, uh, in our budget, increase the amount of money that we're getting in property tax relief. So there was quite a bit of, of money that we invested in property tax relief as well. Wow, 
busy year. Um, what bills did you introduce and which ones are you most proud of? Well, thank you for asking. We had a, a very successful year in our office as well. We introduced ten, ten bills that passed. Um, and of those, the one that I feel probably has the broadest and longest term impact is a bill that we introduced to allow nurse practitioners to practice without a contract with a physician. And that's really important all across the state because it helps us address healthcare workforce issues that we're having. And that, I think, just really imp improves access to healthcare across the state. Mm -hmm. And it also allows these uh, nurse practitioners who are licensed and credentialed to get out there and provide health care. And so it's also an important business opportunity for many of those people who are nurse practitioners across the state. We also have one of the specialties of nurse, of nurse practitioners is psychiatric nurse practitioners. Mm -hmm. So this also plays a key role in improving our behavioral health mm -hmm. workforce in the state. So it, it, I think it will really have broad impacts throughout the state. And I, it, I now meet people who talk to me about how important it is. Just yesterday, I was at a meeting with many public health departments across mm -hmm. the state, and someone came up to me and told me how, it was, how important it was for their work. So mm -hmm. that's very exciting. Um, one of the bills that I'm proud of in terms of families, and especially families in my own district, is a bill that creates custody protections for divorced military members who were deployed. Mm -hmm. And we did that in a way that makes sure that our custody protections in our state are similar to custody protections in other states. So as those military members go from state to state, there's some continuity there. And as the JAG officers are working with families, that they under, are, it's easier for them to understand the Nebraska protections. So that makes sure that um, there's a framework that judges use um, and protects a military member from having deployment used against them in custody, because we don't want that to happen, and also it creates a framework for arrangements to be made for the child to see their extended family when the military member is deployed. And we had um, a guard member come in and talk about how difficult it was when she was deployed because um, her estranged husband didn't let the kids see the grandkids and their, you know, siblings, step-siblings. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we ask a lot of military members, and so it's important that we're thinking as a state how to take care of their families, and I think this was, so I'm very proud of that effort to make sure we're taking care of those families and taking care of those kids when the military members are deployed. I think the military needs to be, you know, um, taken care of because mm -hmm. of uh, everything that they have done for us. You know, they sacrifice so much, and I think sometimes we take that for granted. Right. So, what do you see as the priorities for next year? So, one of the issues that we have not yet been able to tackle successfully <laughs> is to accept the federal money that's available for expanding our health care system. So we are giving up millions of dollars um, that we've paid um, in our taxes to the federal government that we could be using to get over 50,000 more Nebraskans access to health care. Mm -hmm. And that continues to be a top priority and um, we're working on that again for next year. We have a great coalition of Democrats and Republicans who are working together on that in the interim here to try to come up with a plan that we can bring everybody behind, or at least a majority, yeah. a, a filibuster-proof <laughs> majority, veto-proof majority behind this idea to really um, provide that kind of access in our state. It, it's not just um, important for those families that don't have health insurance. Obviously that's critically important. That by itself should be enough to move in this direction. But it also has really important implications in terms of public safety. Because one of the things we found in the states that have expanded Medicaid is that then they're able to make sure that as people leave prison, they're able to continue their mental health treatment, mm -hmm. continue their prescriptions, and you reduce recidivism by making sure you're taking care of people's mental health needs. And that has turned into great cost savings in many of the states. So it's just an additional reason why it's important we move on this issue. I, I agree with you totally. What you, one of the things you said was that Republicans and Democrats are working together during right. the interim, and that's what needs to be done everywhere. Right. Right. But what seems to be the, the point that the opposition says about not 
you know, renewing or mm -hmm. getting the Medicaid into our state. Why, what's the main reason? They, I mean, it's our money that we right. paid in, right. and just like continuing mental health after right. they're out of prison, what is their objection? So, they, one of the concerns that is raised is the concern about sustainability. So, the, it is the case that the federal dollars um, gradually decline. They end up then being where the federal government pays 90% and we pay 10%. So we want to make sure that we're attentive to ensuring that we can pay our part as it continues in future years. So um, we've been working hard to provide analysis to allow senators to understand what that looks like so that they can understand that, th that there are other savings that come in that make it sustainable. Mm -hmm. So the money that you save in all these other areas helps make it easier to pay that 10% eventually. And so just trying to, you do that analysis and show them what that looks like over time so that they can feel comfortable that it is a sustainable investment. Okay. And the other issue that we are trying to show them is you have to also think about there still are costs if you don't do it. And one of the real challenging parts of political debate is helping people understand the cost of doing nothing. Oh right? my, yes. So yes, there is a cost. <laughs> To, um, to our part that we pay, but you have to look at the cost of doing nothing. You still have uncompensated care, you have people returning to prison, you have all of these costs that are out there if you do nothing. So the question is, how, do the, how does the cost of creating this wonderful opportunity in our state compare to the cost of doing nothing? nothing. And, and I think people will see it's a worthwhile investment. And what I love about um, what you said is, Earlier you used the word investment. So many times people look at this as a cost without looking at something as an investment where you get a return that's mm -hmm. positive. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what we need to do mm -hmm. as a state. Um, as a legislator, what happens between now and the beginning of the next session? So right now we're in the interim, and so we're working hard on interim studies. And if people are interested in seeing some of the issues that we're working on, you can go to the unicameral website and you can see a list of the different interim studies that we're working on. And one of the interim studies that I mentioned already is an interim study on Medicaid and what to do with the future of Medicaid. Another interim study committee that I'm on is looking at Access Nebraska. And we've just had all kinds of challenges with Access Nebraska in terms of really helping people who are in trouble get the help they need as quickly as possible. So we continue to work on trying to improve that system in our state. Um, and um, I just got back from a conference with some of my colleagues that was looking at working family issues. And so we're working hard to see what we need to do to help our working families get the training they need and connect to the jobs to help them get into higher wage jobs. Um, because we, and we have many businesses that are needing workers and wanting right. workers. So just to help us see what do we need to do as a state to better connect people to jobs to make sure that we're both growing the state and getting people the wages that they need to be successful. So those are all studies that we're looking at. Our office is also has an interim study on paid family leave. So we're looking at what's happened in some other states where employees pay a very small amount per month to get access to some paid family leave when something happens in their family. Mm -hmm. And in the, some of the states that have been able to do it, the employers actually love it because it allows employers of all sizes to compete with the big companies, because the big companies can afford to offer some kind of paid family leave. Um, but so if there's a state infrastructure there to help paid family leave, then it allows small businesses to be able to allow their employers, employees to take time off when they need um, and, and compete for quali quality talent um, against the, the big folks who oh. can afford paid family leave. All right. Well, Senator Crawford, we are so proud um, to have you in the unicameral and your integrity. I love that you research and you listen to your constituents and you're just kind of like a hero to me because of how you conduct yourself in the legislature. Thank you. I so I really that. so we're looking forward to the new session and your reelection in 2016. Oh, thank and you. so I wondered if you want to say oh, any party words. <laughs> thank you so much. Yes, it is the case that 
um, now we're not only working the interim on those issues that will come to the legislature, but I am working on preparing for running for re-election in 2016. And we do have a campaign website that people can visit and they can see opportunities to get involved and little, learn a little bit more about the campaign side of what I'm doing. So I appreciate that very much and I thank you for your oh, support and you're help. very welcome. I can only be there doing that work if I have people who are supporting me. And I really appreciate your support and the support of Sarpy County Democrats that's made it possible for me to serve the state. And um, Senator Crawford brings up a good point. We have candidates that want to represent you in different areas of the state, uh, as far as from state school board to the, the Senate, any election. They can't do it alone. It costs money. They need our help. So please, if you want to elect someone who would be a good representative for you, please get involved and volunteer. The website will be shown on the screen. And thank you for tuning, tuning in to Sarpy County. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.